For New Yorker Mark Seidenfeld, it was the chance of a lifetime to run one of Kazakhstan's growing telephone companies. This was really a, a great opportunity, sort of an adventure, if you will. But the dream job turned to a nightmare when Mark fell on the wrong side of a local power broker. Of course, this is quite a dangerous thing to do in uh, an environment like Kazakhstan. It would see Mark flung into a bleak Siberian jail, dragged thousands of miles in a prison train full of violent criminals, before facing trial on trumped-up charges. I suddenly get this sinking feeling that things are not going as planned. living in New York City. Last job had finished and was looking around for a new opportunity. I had looked around in the US and 9-11 had sort of canceled out a lot of opportunities that I had been looking at over there. One day I'm just reading the newspaper and in the employment section there's this big block letter ad saying, you know, opportunity for a COO of telephone company in Kazakhstan. And I'm thinking, this is cool. What I did was just, you know, took my resume and faxed it to the number listed in the advertisement and promptly forgot about it. Next morning, I get a phone call. How soon can we meet? And I'm sitting there, you know, looking at the phone, trying to figure out, is this real? What did I get myself into? And you know, should I actually go to the interview or not? But unemployed and with his marriage over, Mark did go to the interview. A month later, he arrived in Almaty to become the chief executive of one of Kazakhstan's new telecoms companies, Arna. I knew very little about Kazakhstan. As the airplane lands, you, you get a view of this amazing mountain range, which, you know, stretches basically as far as the eye can see. First thing that, that hits you when you're leaving the airport and driving into town on the outskirts, you know, you're still looking at the drab Soviet era, you know, gray, huge apartment blocks. And then as you go in, you start seeing these very attention-grabbing buildings. A crossroads between Asia and Europe, Almaty had once been a stopping point on the Silk Road to China. Now, with the fall of communism and independence from Russia, thanks to its vast oil reserves, Kazakhstan was booming. Almaty was an extremely, and still is, an extremely dynamic city. Make no mistake, this is no Bora. This is a place that has its high rises, its uh, investment bankers, the oil companies, the five-star hotels. If someone at that point in time was looking for an unparalleled opportunity for business, adventure. It would be hard to beat what Kazakhstan offered at the time. For Mark, who was just 34, it was a huge break. Although he'd worked in telecoms before, he'd never run a company. There's a certain amount of apprehension. You're in a new country. It's a new set of responsibilities. As confident that you may be in, in your abilities, you know, there's still that much that's, that's a challenge to yourself that you're going to have to get through. It was early 2002 when Mark began work as chief executive of Arna. It was really weird because you, you walk in and all the people are looking at you with a mixture of, say, apprehension or not really knowing. And, you know, all these thoughts are going through my head of, yes, I can do it. But then there's that little voice in back saying, well, better make sure you can. Arna's chairman was British banker John Ward, someone with considerable experience of working in the new markets of the former Soviet Union. My impressions when I first met him was perhaps, hmm, a brash young man in a hurry to get to wherever he wants to be. He clearly has uh, an ability to translate uh, that energy into action, which is uh, the attribute that I came to admire most. 
Mark's brief was simple. Grow the company into a lucrative business, which could then be sold on for a tidy profit. The higher value the company had upon exit, the larger bonus that a significant amount of the management team would get, myself included. I was well aware of the way that business is conducted and the risks and opportunities that that involved. So when I started work in Kazakhstan, I was pretty convinced that I was well prepared for anything that might happen. After several months at the helm of telecoms company Arna, Mark Seidenfeld thought he was getting the hang of doing business Kazakh style. Having good connections and networking, especially in these parts of the world, are very important to getting your business done. Once a month, there would be a get-together primarily of expats, uh, the business community, and they called it the kindred spirits. So this was a group of people, a society, that donated bottles uh, for a very pleasant evening, which involved drinking as much malt whiskey as you could possibly uh, tolerate, and included in that would be uh, some rather nice uh, cigars. Mark saw this as a way of promoting his business and himself as, uh, uh, as part of the process of getting to know people. This just allowed us to go directly to the top. If you figure on the total amount spent on these bottles of whiskey and cigars and the amount of contracts that we got out of it, uh, it was probably the most uh, cost-effective uh, marketing that in the history of business. Of course, uh, any business that's operating in uh, these emerging markets, it's always useful to have someone who knows how the system works. For Mark Seidenfeld, that man was Murat Zunusov. Arna shareholder, local Mr. Fixit, and power broker. Murat makes a tremendous first impression. He's an extremely physically fit individual. He has a black belt in Aikido. He dresses in the finest and latest Italian fashions, which, if I remember correctly, he makes a uh, biannual trip to Milan to, uh, you know, to stock up. His English is very, very good, and in general gave a very, very good impression of someone that I'd be able to work with. When they hired me, I was told that I have this tremendously easy job because all of these issues that had to deal with politics, government, licensing, all of this would be taken off my shoulders and Murat, this would be his full-time job dealing with these issues. Murat Zanusov uh, is an interesting character. Um, when you meet him, you meet a very urbane, very well-educated, very pleasant, very personable individual. Um, it's only when one gets to know him a little better that perhaps the things that he says uh, are not the things that he's going to do. And perhaps uh, the methods that he uses to achieve whatever ends he's seeking uh, are less than fair and less than above board. Thanks to Mark, six months after joining Arna, the phone company was booming. When I got to Arna, we were dealing in voice only and in one city. On a month-to-month -month basis, we had already doubled revenues. We were in five cities. We were doing data, internet, satellite, you name it. And it was a company that everyone knew and had a reputation for being dynamic, ahead of the curve, on top of technology. Life in general was, you know, about as good as it gets. To get there, Mark had to make some tough decisions. The company had more employees than it needed to get the job done. A lot of those were people that had been hired because they were friends of or relatives of either current or past shareholders or high-level employees. There were a number of um, positions which were filled by people who technically weren't really up to the job or had no technical knowledge whatsoever. Many of those people owed their jobs to influential Arna shareholder and fixer, Murat Zanusov. 
usually I would have a talk with them explaining that you actually have to earn your salary, which for some people was a very radical concept. So there were some difficult decisions that Mark had to make. Most of these people, because of their friendship to Murat, they felt that they were untouchable. And at first they would say, well, do you know who I am or that Murat hired me? And I would say, that's, that's really wonderful. I understand that Murat is involved in a variety of different businesses, and I think you can ask him for a job in one of them. But here at Arna, you know, this is, you know, you got to earn your keep. And of course, this is quite a dangerous thing to do in uh, an environment like Kazakhstan because uh, this would be seen as a rejection, not of the individual, but of the person who is promoting him. Who do you think you're talking to, huh? I am Murat. Murat. You remember Murat, me, huh? When Murat heard that his cronies had been fired, he began threatening his chief executive, Mark Seidenfeld. I came to the realization that you know, Murad has sort of two sides to him. One is the rational business side. He then becomes this, you know, emotional, uncontrollable Mr. Hyde. And, you know, that definitely created uh, a certain amount of fear. Please, No one really expected, myself included, for any of those threats to transpire into anything tangible. He did not attend another board meeting after that. Um, one can only suppose that he was not a happy man. But his anger didn't stop Mark. Now Arna's CEO turned his sights on Murat himself. He had a fixed salary, but in addition to that fixed salary, he had um, basically unlimited expenses. We paid rent on a fairly nice house, uh, full-time security guards, uh, both for the house and for him personally car driver, and all of this amount, you know, generally came out to between one and $200,000 a year. Morat would hand in, let's say, in a month, you know, $1,000 worth of restaurant bills. I'd say, Morat, what's that for? And he would say, oh, it was for taking various people out to dinner or to discuss various strategy or a new contract. But as time went on and we're not getting the contracts and we're not getting our issues taken care of, then it calls into question as to why are we spending this money? He was costing us this significant amount of money, yet uh, virtually none of the tasks that he had been assigned, none of them were being accomplished. It was agreed that this contract should be terminated. But unfortunately, it was Mark who had to actually sit down with him and say, the contract is now at an end. What has to be done has to be done. So. I can't say that there was a fear of giving him the news, although uh, by this time we knew him well enough to expect that he would attempt some type of uh, revenge. You sure this is what you want? But I think you just made a very, very bad decision. He uh, lost his contract, and at that time, I guess, it was probably one or his only source of uh, livelihood and he saw Mark as the instrument by which these actions were executed. But I don't think any of us um, thought that uh, uh, he would take the actions that he did. As you can see, over the last four years... With Murat out of the way, Mark was able to get back to the business of growing Arna. By 2004, after two years running the company, its profits had tripled. It was time to put Arna on the market and for Mark and his European investors to cash in. Selling the company or finding buyers for the company it was about as easy as you could imagine. Ten different buyers came forward to express interest. One of them was shareholder Murad Zanusov himself. I was at a telecom show in Europe at the time and received a hysterical phone call from Murat. Threatening, yelling, it was really difficult to make sense of what he was saying. He was absolutely livid that we would have the, uh, the audacity to go in there and offer a competing bid, which was actually better for the shareholders. But you, you want to kill everybody who loves you! You understand?
Murad finally succeeded in buying Anna. But it was only through bidding $5 million more than he'd originally bargained for. Five million that would come back to haunt Mark Seidenfeld. Uh, Murad has said quite openly that Mark was responsible for him paying, I think, $5 million too much for the business. Within just a couple of hours of Murat taking control of Anna, Mark and his senior management team were fired. Mark himself was accused of embezzling $40,000 of Anna's money. The wording that they used was that we were temporarily being dismissed pending an investigation into the finances of the company. We did register with the U.S. Embassy, and the U.S. Embassy, for whatever reason, said, look, you know, this is, you know, you're not in Kansas anymore, so to speak, and gave us their 24-hour uh, their hotline and said, you know, we're not expecting anything to happen, but if anything does, or if you feel in any type of danger, why don't you give us a call? Although an independent investigation quickly cleared his name, Mark decided to leave Kazakhstan, thinking that would be the last he would ever hear of Murad Zanusov. He moved to Moscow and soon found a new job with a large Russian mobile phone company. I was able to land a good position with the top telecoms company uh, in Russia with a very bright career path in front of me. Now fluent in Russian, Mark quickly settled into life in the capital. With him was his new Russian girlfriend, Natia. We met for the first time when he asked me to lunch. We worked in the same office. When I saw him, he was handsome and well-dressed, like a James Bond character. We had a good conversation, which led to a relationship. Mark's new role involved traveling all over Russia drumming up business. One such trip in late 2005 took him to the remote Siberian town of Blagoveshensk, close to the border with China. This was the last business trip that I was going to be making during that calendar year, and Nati and I were scheduled to go to Morocco on vacation with some friends of ours. He was at the airport about to board a plane home when he was called aside. The ticket agent turns to a policeman that was standing nearby, and based on what usually happens, I just thought that this guy is going to check my papers and my registration, which is something normally done to foreigners. He starts opening and looking and checking my passport against this paper. And I see the words on this paper, Kazakhstan and Arna. I suddenly get this sinking feeling that things are not going as planned. What's going on? When I get to the police station, that's when they start telling me that, oh, you're, there's a warrant out from Kazakhstan. We're going to extradite you, and you're going to be placed in prison. Probably by that time, you know, I've, I've crossed the border and or gone through airports on maybe 30, 40 occasions since leaving Kazakhstan. It, it just didn't compute. Emotionally, it, it is very insane and shocking to, to have this happen, but the emotions didn't kick in first. Mark was thrown into a police cell with other local criminals, but he was allowed one phone call to his girlfriend, Natia. Hi, Natia. Remember the threats that Morat made in Kazakhstan? It seems that they've come true. I've been arrested. I hope this works out as soon as, you know, as soon as possible. Whatever happens, I want you to know that I love you and that was the end of the phone call. It was early in the morning, around five o'clock. The phone rang and it was kind of unexpected. I was shocked and I expected it to be a wrong number.
it turned out that Mark was wanted in Kazakhstan on the same old trumped-up charges of embezzling Anna's funds. The accusations had been spelled out previously in great detail. They had been proven false. The charges that Kazakhstan was seeking my extradition for were those exact same charges with the exact same, so to speak, proofs. American telecoms executive Mark Seidenfeld had been arrested on the way home to Moscow from a business trip to Siberia. It looked as if his old adversary, Murat Zanusov, was behind it. The reason for arresting me there is very simple. Uh, if I would be in Moscow, all my friends, uh, Natya, uh, people from work, would be able to come and give me moral support. By having me arrested in Blagoveshensk, that's even more disorienting. This is not a hop, skip, and a jump. You know, the flights aren't even, you know, daily or anything like that. It put that much more pressure on me, and it was that much more of a revenge. If found guilty by a Kazakh court, Mark faced up to 10 years in prison. The second or third day is probably when I started the, the really most, probably the most difficult period in my life ever, because that's when it's hit home that I am now behind a lock and key in a prison, and all that starts to really, really get to you. Blagoveshensk is an extremely cold place, and it can get down to minus 40, minus 50 uh, Celsius. And just to be able to sleep, we would take plastic soda bottles and warm up water. This hot water bottle would give you enough warmth to allow you to go to sleep. After a couple hours, I would be waking up from the cold and then have to go through the whole process again of getting more hot water to put into these bottles. So to get six hours of sleep, there were at least you know, three changes of water. You are in your cell for 23 hours a day. There's one hour of exercise and you get taken out to this, uh, it's not even a yard, it's basically a concrete patio, if you will. And to keep my health, I would just circle around the perimeter. First couple of months I did this, I did it running. But when you're running in such a small perimeter, you have to constantly lean. And that eventually caused some major pain in my knee, and I had to stop that, so I, I uh, changed over to just fast walking. By my measurements, I was able to do between uh, three and four kilometers a day of walking. The question comes up of, do you think, did you ever think of escaping? If you, for one thing is, how? There are armed guards, high walls, barbed wire, and number two, from a practical sense, okay, l let's say you've made it out of the prison walls. I'm an American, I'm in Siberia, where am I gonna go? After 23 days behind bars, Mark's lawyer finally arrived with an extraordinary offer from Murat himself. Murat will make sure that I am kept in prison unless ransom is paid to him in the amount of $5 million. $5 million. The exact same amount that Murat thought he'd overpaid when he'd bought Anna. I have no idea where Murat could conceive that I would come up with anywhere near that amount of cash. It was quite obvious that Murat had used either money, influence, or both to uh, have the, the police pursue this and issue an extradition warrant. My thoughts about Murat at that time was that I think this gentleman needs uh, psychological care because he can't let go of something that was fought out, if you will, honest and fair. I did my job. I'm proud that I did it, and I wouldn't have done it any other way. Prison's not a nice place. There's no customer service hotline. 
if you're not happy with the conditions. Now, there are definitely sadistic guards around in the prison systems that, you know, that beat, that break ribs, that break arms. You know, the less friendly guards obviously sort of took, I guess, pleasure in the fact that they see you suffering. At one point, this gorilla basically slams me against the wall. Because he's a foreigner, Mark was moved into a cell alone while his lawyers tried to secure his release. Maybe the first while that I was in solitary, there was a perception of this might be good. But then the tricks that your mind starts playing and, and the tremendous psychological pressure. Your mind is used to actually working, doing something, thinking of things. You're used to solving problems. All of this is gone. You're basically an, an animal in a cage. You don't have any freedom. You don't have any control over anything. You're isolated. And boredom is torture. Not only was there the shock of, of being arrested and now having my freedom taken away from me, but I have no one to talk to. I have no one to commiserate with. And I'm bored as hell with nothing to do but to think about the process, which is a vicious cycle. Because the more you think about it, the worse it gets. All three meals were sort of mystery goulash type of stuff. This is the food that's served it's three times a day, seven days a week, 365 a year. Occasionally, Mark would get an old newspaper or magazine. When I got this reading material, what I would force myself to do is read up to a certain amount and then try to space out, try to daydream, try to sleep or, or do something so that you know, the, the magazine or the book at that time was by far my most treasured possession. By the time I had been under arrest for about five weeks, I get called out and I think I'm just going to someone in the administration or maybe another medical check. And I get taken to the, the visitation room and Nadia's sitting over there. Of course, I was very nervous, and I didn't want to let him know I was. I, I, I was just overcome with so many emotions at once because on one hand, I'm feeling so guilty for putting her through all this. Yet at the same time, I'm, I'm overjoyed that she is supporting me and that she has come out here. For a long time, he hadn't seen anyone. There was no support or even a lawyer. So naturally, there was a whole confusion of emotions. Fear, love, everything. Natia decided to stay in Siberia to support Mark. I couldn't afford to abandon him or give him an excuse to break down. After four weeks of solitary confinement, Mark's legal team was no nearer to securing his release. Firing his lawyers, he finally decided that he had no alternative but to return to Kazakhstan to face trial. But there was a very real risk. The judge could be in the pay of Murat Zanusov. I was not certain at all that there would be a fair trial. You know, you're dealing with what essentially is a third world country that does not have a judicial tradition. I had absolutely no expectations. Russia has a system for transporting prisoners over their vast territory, and they transport prisoners by train. 
the two and a half thousand mile train journey from Blagovezhensk to Almaty would take over a month, stopping along the way to pick up and drop off prisoners at some of Russia's most notorious jails. In my case, it was seven stops between Blagovezhensk and Almaty prison and basically get on a train, spend anywhere between four and 72 hours on that train, and then be let off at the local prison where that, you know, the prison truck would transport you and then you go through all the procedures of being booked in and registered and staying in that local prison anywhere from uh, 48 hours up to uh, eight days. I haven't been able to sleep. With each kilometer passed, I felt I'm getting closer to some type of resolution. The demeanor of the guards would range for the whole spectrum of human personalities. And you'd have some guys who would actually interact with you as a, with another human being you know, all the way to the other end of some really sadistic guys who would treat you like you're just a piece of garbage. The worst thing about the prison train has to be the bathrooms. In each car, there's, there can be 50, 60 prisoners. There's one bathroom. By the time you're a couple hours into the trip, by the time the first time they've made the runs and let everyone go to the bathroom, this is not some place you want to visit. There was one thing that kept Mark going. Natia, who followed the train as it rumbled across the Siberian landscape. Natia managed to come to every city that I was during my train trip. At every stop, at every station, I tried to catch a glimpse of him and to make sure that he saw me so that we could support each other with a glance. I would instruct a lawyer to see him every day, pass food to him so that he wouldn't be alone. If Nadia hadn't been involved the whole way through, I would be, you know, one of two things. I'd either be dead or it'd be on a funny farm. After 32 days on the prison train, Mark finally arrived in Almaty for his day in court. Accused of embezzling $40,000 from his old company, Arna, he was facing a trial that could see him imprisoned for a decade. I always knew that I was innocent, and I always knew that the facts and the documentation proved that. It had been very obvious that the only way they even got the case started was through corruption. As far as I understand, in most of the former Soviet Union, if you have been accused of a crime, have spent any time behind bars, even if it's something that you have obviously not committed, the 99% chance is that you will be convicted. The allegations against Mark had already been investigated by independent auditors and dismissed. There was only one reason they'd been dragged up again. Murat Zanusov and his vendetta against Mark. I was enormously um, frightened and apprehensive because to sustain the charges, clearly the system was not being allowed to operate in the normal way. The charges had no substance. Uh, but of course, Mark being in prison in the first place meant that the system had been interfered with. Extradited from Russia, American executive Mark Seidenfeld was back in the Kazakh capital of Almaty on trial for fraud. 
we're getting conflicting reports to the to the very end as to this is going to be a fair trial. This is not going to be a fair trial. I'm nervous. My lawyer's nervous. Natya's nervous. A succession of prosecution witnesses were called to testify against Mark. All of them protégés of Anna's new owner, Murad Zanusov. At the heart of the case was the evidence of Anna's former cashier. I think one moment during the trial really stands out in my mind, which was when the cashier herself was forced to admit under the cross-examination of the judge that she had not written the complaint or the accusation on her own, but that she had been put up to it and had not even written it, had basically signed her name at the bottom of a paper that Murat's lawyers had prepared for her. The evidence that this cashier had uh, presented was complete rubbish, manipulated, partial information, which no accountant was going to place any value on. Despite the fact that every single witness for the prosecution had been totally discredited, totally ripped to shreds, there was still no way to know where the trial would go because by declaring me innocent, the judge was basically declaring the law enforcement agencies as incompetent and in the worst case corrupt. And that is not usually done in the former Soviet Union. The trial was becoming a battle between Mark's word and that of the man pulling the strings behind the scenes, Murat. We made a motion to the court that Murat must be called as a witness. Murat Zunasov. And the judge asked, well, where is Murat? And they said, oh, it turns out that he is running a marathon in China. The judge herself actually laughed a little bit and said, oh, sure, and nobody knew about this on Friday. Well, I guess he's just, you know, not a man enough to come here and actually see this through. At the end of a long week of testimony, a tangled web of false accusations and forged documentation had clouded the truth. Mark's freedom now depended on whether the judge would take an honest view of the evidence before her. Nervous as hell. The judge starts reading, and I'm just hearing the judge recount word for word the accusation, and I'm thinking, this is not good. Oh my god, I'm going to be convicted. Natya's listening, I'm looking at her, and I'm seeing that she's starting to cry. We well knew what kind of country this was and what could be in store for us, so I couldn't be 100% sure whether he would get off or be sentenced. Worst comes to worst, they'll send me to a penal colony. When we heard those magic words, Apravdan, which is acquitted. The courtroom literally started cheering and clapping. And Mark is entitled to full compensation for moral and actual damages, which, which is a verdict that, that happens maybe one in 500 in the former Soviet Union. In a legal system notorious for its corruption, Mark had been saved by an honest judge. When the judge read the verdict of not guilty, of course I was very happy to hear it, because that is what we had all hoped for such a very long time. As a free person, to finally be able to give her a tremendous hug. It's the hug that finally has the promise of future and freedom. The court martial, uh, just according to protocol, is supposed to take me back down to the holding cell until my papers are signed and sealed so that they can release me. 
And as he started to do that, the judge sees this from across the room, calls out saying, do not take him back down to the holding cell, take him straight to my chambers, I will sign the papers immediately. This guy's sat long enough, he's not gonna sit a minute more. Uh, relieved is an understatement, right? He was, he was pleased uh, that he could actually walk in the open street again, that he could go and buy a pizza, he could uh, you know, just spend time with Natya. If it hadn't been for Natya's devotion and love, I wouldn't be here today. I would either not be among the living, or I'd probably be in a padded cell somewhere, laughing and screaming. But though the trial was over, the threat from Murat had not gone away. We were, of course, worried that you know, having not been able to punish me in the way that he wanted to, using or bending the legal system, that there is a possibility, of course, that he could resort to something more primitive and crude. Wasted no time, I immediately traveled across the border to Kyrgyzstan. Today, Mark is back in Moscow, still working in the telecoms business. He and Natia are still together and engaged to be married. Mark Seidenfeld has no plans to return to Kazakhstan. This whole experience has definitely made me a bit more careful. I think that any expat who goes out to these places should be well aware that the danger exists, take the proper precautions as much as you can, and then cross your fingers and pray, because all of those precautions may not help you.